This is a turbo manifold and turbo compressor housing and both of them need to be modified. Now the compressor housing needs an elbow chopped and the manifold has a wastegate port that needs to go bye bye. Now for the most part this job is pretty straightforward aside from a few discoveries that we kind of had to work around. But there's always something to learn here like what is 201 stainless and how do you deal with cheap parts that are made out of it. So if that's something that you want to see, stick around because I got all that info in this episode of the Fabrication Series. Since the elbow chop on the compressor housing is a really easy job, I'll start with the wastegate port delete. Now the first thing that we gotta do is remove the bulk of the elbow that is currently welded on. A simple cutoff wheel does the trick. Now one thing I'd like to point out when removing parts like this is that you don't need to cut it off completely flush or perfect on the first try. Cutoff wheels only cut straight, so trying to turn them or angle them during the cut causes them to jam and can even explode. So definitely take your time and find a clean and straight cut path. On this one, I ended up having to cut the top of the elbow away just to gain access to the throat of the bend. But either way, all straight cuts, nice and easy. The next step is to remove the remaining carnage with an 80 grit flap disc. Now if you didn't notice, this is a brand new flap disc which will be dedicated to nothing but stainless grinding from now on. Using a disc that was used on other materials will embed those materials into this material, which usually causes problems like rust or corrosion further on down the road. This manifold is also considered to be a cheap or budget friendly manifold. Most cheap manifolds are usually constructed of a lesser grade material and they usually have build quality issues, like this section in Emerge being nothing but filler material instead of a clean pass over a proper fit up. Little things like this is what you're going to end up kind of running into and what I'm basically saying here is that this is pretty common to find on budget friendly parts and dealing with them adds more labor time to the cost of the job when you have to go and correct it. So don't be surprised if you actually see this on cheaper parts. The remaining hole for this port was also cut all over creation, so I have to kind of use my carbide burr tool to round it out a little bit more to get a better consistent fit up with it. Now once those operations were complete, I removed the heavy grinding marks with a red surface prep pad to semi-restore the original finish here. Doing this step now is going to make less work for later. Creating the patch pieces is actually pretty easy. I started by marking the center line of the part where the weld seam is located. Next, a few layers of tape were laid over half of the hole with the straight edge of the tape lined up with the weld seam. A quick and careful trace with the razor blade gives me a perfect pattern to then transfer onto a piece of 304 stainless pipe. I did this for both halves. Now, as I mentioned earlier, cutoff wheels don't like to turn or rotate. So to get the curvature of the pipe close enough, I made a series of straight line cuts close to the edge. Now I'll chase out the radius with a grinder later on when I fit them into the manifold. Now while I make these cuts, let's talk about a couple of things. I mentioned earlier that the manifold is a budget friendly part and it definitely had some build quality issues to show for it. What most people don't know about budget friendly parts like turbo manifolds and exhaust systems is that almost all of them are constructed out of grade 201 stainless steel. Now, if you've never heard of 201, you're not alone. 201 stainless steel was actually created around the 1950s in an effort to combat high nickel prices, which is one of the main ingredients in stainless steel. Now, 201 stainless has about half the nickel in it compared to 304 grade, which has about 8%. Now, half the material is half the price, which when combined with cheap labor makes a cheaper budget-friendly part. Now, we'll talk more about 201 in a minute, but for right now, we got to fit these pieces up. Fitting patch pieces requires a combination of patience and pickiness. Now depending on your skill level or experience, and of course the complexity of the patch itself, this may require a few attempts to get just right. Now, in my case, I'm not overly worried about having a slight gap since I will be grinding these patches down. But having a groove or a gap for the filler to flow into means that there will still be plenty of metal holding the patch in place once I grind down the final weld. Now, these patches also required a bit of forming to get just right. The first panel could be tweaked and bent a little bit with my plier hammer combination tool. But the second patch needed just a little bit more work though.
Okay, we're pretty close here, but you can see we've got a high spot and we've got a low spot. So what we need to do is kind of bend this up a little bit. We'll swoop it up like that, like that. And then when we do that, we can bring this kind of nose in a little bit and that'll bring this backside back up. Because obviously this was four round pieces merged into what is now a rounded corner rectangle. So we gotta do some forming out of it, but as soon as we get it just right, we'll do some final trims, get it tacked up, weld this sucker shut, and we're good to go. Hmm, you know, I swore I captured the bending of the second patch on video, but I'm not seeing it in the footage here. So it basically means that I probably moved the camera, framed up the shot, and totally forgot to push record like a complete dummy. But either way, the part fits the contour now, and I simply bent it into place with some vice grips. Like, no big deal, no special tools, pretty straightforward. Hold on, gotta check focus. We're good. So just to show you that nobody's perfect, I did nick this little section here with the uh, cutoff wheel when I was actually cutting the elbow off of here, but it's easily repairable. We're just gonna go over it very lightly with the amps, and if you watch my fingers, it's kinda like a wiggle technique just to fill it up with filler, right? We're not trying to pop through, get full pen, or anything else like that. We're just building it up so that we can grind it smooth later and blend it all in. Pretty straightforward. And now for some welding. Now regardless of the different grades of stainless that we're combining here, they're still susceptible to carbide precipitation or what most of you guys know as sugaring of the backside of the weld, which will definitely cause a failure of our work later. So the solution, as with all stainless steel, is to back purge with 100% argon. Now this is done with a second line flowing at about 10 cubic feet per hour the entire time I am welding. Now I also let the purge line run for about five minutes before welding so it will fill the part completely with argon. My filler of choice is 308 and the diameter I'm using is 045. Now the reason I'm using such a small filler is so I can control my deposition rate or how much filler goes into the part. Now with a smaller diameter filler, I can push more wire in if needed, and since I'm filling a decent sized root opening here, it's good to have that kind of control. Now I really don't want to use a larger filler that will just kind of sit on top of the root. I want it to burn through. Now, if you've been listening carefully, you heard that we technically have three different grades of stainless here. Now the manifold is grade 201, the patches are grade 304, and my filler is grade 308. Now how do I know that this is going to work? Well, pretty simply, stainless steel is categorized in five different categories, or sometimes called families. Now without geeking out too much about stainless, the category of stainless that we are working with is austenitic, which basically means that we can combine different grades without much worry of microfractures and all other adverse effects when combining with different categories. And the reason I am using 304 for the patches instead of the same 201 that it's made out of is that I only have 304 on hand. I don't usually go out of my way to buy lesser grades just to fix and modify cheap parts. It's just not worth it to me. Oh, and just to show you that I'm still human after 21 years of welding, here is me sending my filler straight into the tungsten on the last dab. And for what it's worth, to those of you who do this regularly because you are learning to TIG, uh, this is never going to go away. <laughs> no matter how good you get, it's still going to happen. I hope that's reassuring. Now, while I could have just welded this entire part up and sent it on its merry way, I actually chose to add a nice finishing operation before laying down the final weld. Now, I feel like simply hacking off an elbow and leaving visible patches just kind of looks tacky regardless of how cheap the part may be. It's the little details in your work that really make it stand out. So the finish work on this one took just four easy steps. Step one is to grind the welds flush with an 80 grit flat disc. Step two is to sand down the grinding marks and restore the radius of each tube since grinding is linear and leaves flat lines on the part. 80 grit paper on my sander does a great job at blending all of that in. Step three is to remove the 80 grit marks with a red surface prep pad, which is soft enough to not grind heavy flat lines back into the part like a flap disc does. 
And finally, step four is to remove the red pad marks with a teal pad. This also closely matches the original finish of the manifold. Now, one section of the original weld near the flange was kind of ropey and didn't blend very well into the merge, which means a bunch of junk was trapped under it. I just grabbed a hold of my heavy stainless wire wheel to clean it all up. No big deal. Next comes the final weld. Now, of course, I pumped the part back up with argon and everything else like that for a back purge before welding this, but one thing I wanted to do on this weld was to try and mimic the same style as what's on the rest of the manifold. Now, my welds are usually stacked very tight and extremely uniform, which is not quite what is on this part. So instead of throwing down my signature stack, I actually used a larger filler and stacked each dab a little bit more heavy and more spaced out. Now, I think this looks pretty close, and I do know it's going to hold just fine, so all is well. Here's the before, and here's the after. I'd say it looks pretty good. Now let's move on to the compressor housing. It's a pretty big gap. Let's see if we can get the old flashlight in there. Ooh, the carnage. Yeah, that's nasty. Weave it wide and wish it well. Oof. Oh well. We'll deal with it. Step one, remove the coating. Damn, this is running like actual powder coat. That makes it not easy. So I think what we're going to do is, uh, I think I'm going to do the cut work first because this section I got to do a lot of grinding on, so, oh crap. Yeah, I think I'm going to do the cut work first and then we'll grind down those welds, see if we can butter them up, straighten this out a little bit, and then, yeah, I guess we'll have to attack it with a very heavy wire wheel to get that powder coat off. I was hoping it was just like spray paint or something, but... It's, uh, whatever it is, it's on there like epoxy. Tink. Okay. Yikes. I think I'm going to be forced to clean up all that carnage in there, which obviously is going to cost extra. Dang it, I hate to be the bearer of bad news on these things. Let's see if we just slip off a piece of this. And now we prep. So I'm a little curious if you guys like seeing the raw unscripted footage like I just shot in those last clips, or if you prefer the voiceover Cliff Notes version of the video. Or maybe you don't even care. I mean, hey, just let me know down in the comments. I'll see what you all got to say. So to get the coating off of the parts in order to prep for welding, I simply clamp the straight section into a vise and then hit it heavy with a wire wheel. It's pretty simple. But the carnage from the previous welds was tackled with a carbide burr tool on my die grinder. Now, I'm sorry about my arm being in the way of this shot, but it's usually better if I can see what I'm doing when it comes to sharp cutting tools. Now, the previous welds didn't look too bad after grinding, but I am still not quite letting my guard down as they are probably filled with a lot of pores. If you didn't realize, this compressor housing is actually cast aluminum, and since there is virtually no branding on it, I'm going to assume it's going to be an imported or a cheaper part. I could be wrong, but I can't verify one way or the other, and usually, cast aluminum that's cheap is really, really bad to weld. So, only welding this will tell the tale about how good or bad this stuff is. Now, just in case you aren't familiar with welding cast aluminum, I have a lot of videos explaining how to weld it properly, and even a couple of videos showing you how complicated it can get even for professionals like myself. So I encourage you to check them out, because I'm not throwing in a ton of detail in this vid like I do in the other ones. But either way, the first pass around the part after the tack weld is to push out the junk and get a fresh layer to weld to. As I suspected, this casting is pretty nasty and it is filled with a whole lot of junk. Now in order to combat all of that junk, I dropped my frequency down to about 80 Hz to allow more cycle time and I increased the positive balance to about the 40-60 range for a little bit more cleaning action. Now I have an older video explaining AC balance if you want to understand exactly what it is that I'm talking about. You should definitely check that one out. 
Now, once the junk pass was done, the fill pass followed. Now, my wire of choice on this one is ER4043, and the diameter is 1 16th. Again, the smaller diameter allowed me to better control how much filler was used in the bead. Now, some sections needed a little bit more wire pushed in to fill it up, while other sections needed only a small dab to hold it. The smaller diameter wire allows me to actually control that. Quite nicely, actually. Now, once the welding was all finished, a quick blowout and reassembly was all that was needed to call this job finished. And the total work time for both parts was just shy of four hours, which is $375 in labor, plus about six bucks for the stainless pipe. And that's all I've got for this episode. And I want to thank you guys for watching as always. I'll see you all on the next round.